This is part 84 of my series on my Engage Model Railway project. Previous parts covered the project from its inception through the creation of the baseboard, selection and laying of track, building of scenic items, attaining rolling stock, etc. The project is ongoing. This part deals with locomotive headlamp codes, train tail lamps and footplate crew. A review of the prototype realities and then details of how I've been trying to add these features to my Engage models. When I did the previous video in this series, I dealt in a somewhat offhand manner with the crewing and lamping of a couple of Union Mills locos. I thought when I did that that I'd previously covered the whole issue of crewing and lamping in this video series. But it turns out I was wrong. There was no such previous video, so this is it. A general review of the issues involved in lamps and crew and what I've been doing to try to add lamps and crew to my rolling stock. By the time of the Big Four, the four companies that ran almost all of Britain's railways after amalgamation in 1923, the use of headlamp codes on the front of trains to indicate the type of train was more or less standardised. The exception to this was Southern Railways, which followed its own distinct path, and we'll come back to that a little later. The rest of the Big Four largely followed the codes shown here and the use of these codes was continued by British Railways after nationalisation in 1947, except for the southern region of British Railways, which continued with the Southern Railways way of doing things. So I will be taking these codes as my paradigm, except when dealing with Southern Railways. I don't actually model BR, as my focus is pre-war operations in the late 1920s and 1930s. So, let's have a look at these codes in practice. This train is carrying code A, express passenger train, two lamps, one on each side of the buffer bar. This is one of the codes that you'll see most often in uh, pictures, since uh, pictures lean heavily towards depicting express passenger trains. This code is also very commonly used on preservation railways, as shown here, although that usage is perhaps a little questionable, since an express would normally be a high-speed train not stopping at intermediate stations. Mm, uh, Well-known trains such as the Royal Scot and the Flying Scotsman would, of course, have carried this code. This train, also in preservation, is carrying code B, Ordinary Passenger Train branch passenger train or mixed train, one lamp at the top. This code would presumably have been carried on the majority of passenger trains in the period. Here's another train uh, carrying code B again in preservation. Well, colour pictures are clearer and of course photos of operations in the 1930s would all be black and white. And one more train carrying code B. Note that this time the lamp is on the back of the loco. The code is carried on the front of the train, so if the engine is pulling the train this way, the lamp must be on the back of the loco, or on the back of the tender for tender engines. This train is carrying code C, basically for express freight trains composed of vacuum brake stock, also used for trains carrying parcels, newspapers, cattle or perishable goods such as fruit or fish. This train is in BR operation. Not quite sure what it would be carrying. Could be parcels, vans. Here's another BR train carrying code C. In this case, the train seems to consist of tipplers loaded with coal, so not perishable, but still in express freight, so long as all of the stock is vacuum braked. This train, which is a simulator picture, actually, is also carrying code C and consists of parcel vans, apparently. This train, in preservation in BR livery, is carrying code D, a slightly odd code, indicating a slow-speed express freight train, or a train of passenger stock not actually carrying passengers. Um, this code would be quite appropriate for trains on the preservation railways, as speeds on those railways are mostly limited, and I believe, at least in BR days, this code indicated a, a freight train with a maximum speed of 35 miles per hour. This train is carrying a code E, another one not that commonly seen. So far as I know, this code is supposed to indicate a loco travelling light engine, i.e. not coupled to anything, or an engine only coupled with a brake van. Here's another train showing code E. 
I've actually seen locals on preservation railways carrying this code and pulling entire trains. I'm not sure if this was an oversight or whether they know something I don't about the use of this code. In general, I'd be a bit hesitant to base any conclusions on the use of codes on preservation railways, as the headlamp codes probably don't serve any great purpose for them, and so may be largely cosmetic and not followed entirely diligently. This train is showing a code F, a general code for freight, mineral or ballast train. That's one lamp at the top and one at the, well, bottom right as we're looking at it, bottom left of the loco. In this case, apparently freight, as it does not appear that this train is carrying minerals or ballast. Implicitly, this code would be used for trains not consisting of a vacuum-fitted stock, or at least not entirely, given that there are separate codes for express freight trains. This train, again in preservation, is also carrying code F. And another, apparently mixed freight train carrying code F and yet another longish mix freight train carrying code F. And yet one more. Code F could well be used on model locos expected to pull mix freight trains. Couple more examples of code F. This code would doubtless have been very common on the railways of the 1930s. This train, in preservation, is carrying code G, another odd one, since it just implies a through-fast train without being much more specific. Through-fast train not running under any of the other more specific codes. This is clearly a passenger train in preservation. And this loco, which is currently not coupled to anything, is also showing code G. Actually, it's got the not-to-be-moved sign on it, so it's not in operation at all at the moment. And here's another train showing code G. This is in actual operation, but you can't really tell from the photograph what kind of train this actually was. This train is showing code H, another code for express freight trains not running under code C or D. Why H would be used rather than C or D, I really don't know. This train is carrying code J, indicating a freight, mineral or ballast train stopping at intermediate stations, i.e. a stopping freight train. Here's another stopping freight train carrying code J. And another, this time in preservation. And another real operational stopping freight train under code J. And another train, this one triple-headed. Code J would have been very common as stopping freight trains which could drop off or pick up wagons at many stations were an absolute staple of the railways back in those days. This code is also a lot easier to put on a model as it requires only one lamp on the buffer bar where it's much easier to place lamps. And just to wrap up this survey, here's a train carrying code K, a rather specific code used for trains which needed to stop between signal boxes, such as inspection trains, trains carrying ballast to ballasting crews, or other types of railway servicing trains. Now let's have a look at the other end of the train, the rear. All trains needed to display a lamp on the rear of the last wagon or coach on the train, which would normally be a brake van or brake coach. These lamps had red lenses so that they would not be confused with headlamps, especially at night. The primary purpose of the tail lamp was to verify the completeness of the train. If a signalman saw a train leaving his section with no lamp on the rear, he had to assume that the train had become separated and that part of the train had been left in his section. Conversely, so long as the signalman saw a lamp on the rear of a train leaving his section, he could assume that the entire train had successfully left his section. A single rear lamp would be displayed on the rear of the train for a freight train, generally on a brake van, as seen here. On a passenger train, the rear lamp would be on the last coach, generally a brake coach. On coaches, the lamp would be mounted on the left or right, more generally on the left, but sometimes on the right, and I haven't been able to determine any special significance to which side the lamp was on. On freight trains, the, late, the lamp would often be near the centre of the back of the brake, brake van, but not always, and as I say, so far as I can tell, the exact position of the lamp on the rear had no significance. If you know any difference, please post in the comments. Here's an example of a coach with its rear lamp on the right. 
For corridor coaches, of course, it really wouldn't have been practical to mount the lamp centrally. Now let's briefly turn to the Southern Railways Company. They use discs rather than lamps on the front of their trains generally, and the position of the discs also had a completely different significance to the headlamp codes on the trains of other companies, as it indicated the routing of the train rather than its class. The position of the discs on the front of a southern train would tell knowledgeable staff on the SR which route the train would be taking, uh, e.g. where it would branch from one line to another. The exact codes were highly complicated, and the same arrangement of discs could have different meanings on different parts of the rail network. In other words, to interpret a code, you would have to take into account not only where the discs were on the train, but where the train was currently located on the network. Sometimes the discs also carried markings giving other information. From a modelling point of view, I think it's generally adequate for locos pulling southern trains to display any reasonable looking combination of discs. Southern Railways trains still used rear lamps just the same as trains of other companies, and here's a southern brake van with its lamp mounted on the left. With respect to footplate crew, it isn't easy to find contemporary pictures showing the crew on the footplate during operations in the 1930s. One useful source is the LMS training film Little and Often, which was intended to train firemen in the best practices for feeding coal on steam locomotives. Of course, this is a stage training film rather than a natural depiction of actual operations, but I think it's fair to assume that it basically depicts the crew on the footplate carrying out their duties in a normal manner for the time. Here we see a fireman getting coal down from the tender. Here we can see the driver on the left, which was the normal position for drivers on British Railways for the most part. In this case, a large express engine is depicted and the driver is seated, but on many engines, drivers stood. The fireman is operating the firebox doors in this picture. Here we can see the driver looking ahead as he normally would, operating the reverser, which is a screw type in this case. Here, the driver is looking ahead while the fireman shovels coal into the firebox, a very basic arrangement of their duties. Here, the fireman is turning to get more coal. He would, of course, be constantly turning backward and forth to take coal from the tender and shovel it into the firebox. Since he would also need to pull coal down on the tender, he would probably spend a bit more time shoveling in the reverse position. Here the fireman is facing forward, operating a control, most probably the injector, to add water to the boiler. This would also be a normal part of his duties, and so an appropriate position in which to depict him. Here we can see both members of the crew facing forward and busy. The driver is operating the regulator, and the fireman is probably moving to open the firebox doors. Here's another picture, not from the same film. Um, but from the same period, of a driver operating the regulator. I must say, he seems very young to be a driver, since you only got to be a driver by progressing through other grades, starting as a cleaner. And here's a picture of a footplate crew on a preservation railway, giving some idea of typical colours. So now back to modelling, and more specifically to my own efforts in this direction. At top left here can be seen one of the first sets of loco crew I obtained, um, but it gets a bit expensive buying them this way. At upper right here you can see some packs of springside lamps mounted on green cards. These packs contain five lamps and so work out to about a dollar a lamp if I buy them locally more if I have to import them from the UK. At right here are some more ready painted loco crew, this time from Graham Farish. And one more pack of loco crew at bottom here. Here are some more lamps and crew that I picked up more recently. Given the amount of rolling stock I've accumulated, I will need quite a lot of crew and a lot of lamps. Here's a close-up of the Springside lamps, Great Western in this case, and pre-painted P&D Marsh crew. A cheaper option comes in the form of unpainted white metal figures from P&D Marsh and Fleetline, but a considerable amount of work will be required to get these ready for use. Here's an example of a cheaper option for lamps, unpainted white metal castings from Langley with separately provided jewels. The jewels can be seen here taped down in the pink pack. I've already spray painted the lamps white in this picture, leaving them on the sprue.
Here you can see the jewels better, now I've got them out of the pack. As you may imagine, finishing these lamps was not easy. I used a fine bit in a pin vise to drill out the paint from the cavities of the lamps. I found that the best way to glue the jewels into the lamps was to use the tip of a toothpick to put a tiny amount of CA glue into the lamp cavity, then to lightly mo moisten a Q-tip and touch it to the jewel. The jewel would stick to the moist Q-tip, and then so long as the Q-tip was touched to the clear face of the jewel, the Q-tip could be used to place the jewel into the lamp cavity, hopefully before the glue set. This didn't work too badly once I got the hang of it though I made a better job of some lamps than others. Once the jewels were all glued in, I cut the lamps from the sprue and used a file to smooth the bottoms of the lamps. Here you can see a selection of lamps stored in a tin. Well, you have to be careful with them, because of course they're very easy to lose. This was my first attempt at painting unpainted crew figures. First painting blue overall, then trying to paint in details with a fine brush. Tricky to do with such tiny figures. Here's an additional batch I obtained, half P&D Marsh and half Fleet Line, and here they are out of their bags. Quite a bit of work was required just to remove flash and attachment points and generally clean up the castings. The figures are still a bit crude, even after the best I could do. The figures, like all wet white metal items, need to be painted with primer first. I spray one side, then turn each figure over so I can spray the other side. Then I follow the same procedure with a light blue spray. Spray one side, then turn each figure over to spray the other side. I was limited by what shades of spray paint I could find. This blue seemed a bit too light, so I oversprayed partially with a darker blue. Here are the figures back on the bench, ready for my attempts at detail painting. First I tried to paint heads and hands in flesh tone. Then I used brown for shovel handles and hair on figures without hats. Then I used black for hats and shovels. And then more black for boots and for bases. The figures on the right came with bases, fleet line, and those on the left without, P&D Marsh. On balance, I'd rather have the bases. It's much easier to glue the figures into place when there's a base. It's a devil to CA a figure into place just using glue on the ends of the legs. And the bases can be hidden quite well by painting them matte black. Finally, I gave the figures one more spray. Well, two more, since as before it's necessary to spray one side, let it dry, then turn all the figures over and spray the other side. This final spray was a clear matte acrylic to tone down the shininess of the blues and to fix the hand-painted details, which otherwise might rub or flake off easily. Here are some P&D Marsh bicycles that went through a similar painting per process, first priming, then black, then some detailing with brown and silver. So this was one of the first uh, locos that I added crew and lamps to. This is the Graham Farish 4F in a special Midland Railways edition. This model had a very detailed cab, so I thought it merited an early edition of crew. I've used code J for the headlamp stopping freight train. I actually forgot to paint the bases of the figures on this initial attempt, so they look bad here. You can really see the blue base of the figure. I did paint the bases of the figures black after the fact when I saw how bad they initially looked. I also added a rear lamp to this brake van to complete this train. Here's the engine on the turntable going back to parking in the yard. This is the Union Mills Web Goods, another engine I did early since it's such a good freight loco and gets a lot of use. Again I went with Code J for stopping freight, and I used fleet line figures that I'd painted. Here's the Web Goods back on the layout with a train. It's a pity about the rather heavy wires between loco and tender on the Union Mills models. But I hesitate to try to do anything about those wires, as they're entirely basic to the operation of the models. Again, I've put a rear lamp onto the brake van. 
This is the Duchess of Buccleu, which I converted from a model of King George the Sixth in B.R. Green livery. Since I went to such effort to convert this loco, I thought that I should finish it by uh, crewing and lamping it. Again, I used fleet line figures that I had painted for the crew. Since this is very much an express passenger engine, I went with Code A, express passenger train. And I mounted a rear lamp on a Stanier brake coach to bring up the back of the train. Here's that train on the layout. You can just see the driver in the cab window. And here's the back of the train going round by the woods. You can see the 4F here with its crew, and next to it is the Union Mills Prince of Wales class in red, which I decided to crew and lamp next. Here's the Prince of Wales class named Enchantress on the turntable being brought out, and here on the viaduct ready for me to lift it off the track. Here's the Enchantress on the bench with the crew figures I picked out for it, in this case pre-painted P&D Marsh items. With the Union Mills Locos, I find it much easier to mount the crew with a tender separated from the loco. So I remove one screw and detach the drawbar, and then I replace the, uh, the screw so nothing will come apart while I'm working. These crew figures were actually very difficult to glue in place, since these are the P&D Marsh ones with no bases and could only be fixed by drops of glue on their feet, which is not a sturdy arrangement. Once the fixing of the, of the uh, crew was cured, I reattached the drawbar between loco and tender. And here are the crew, looking, I'm afraid, rather crude in close-up. Again, this is basically an express passenger loco, so I went with code A, picking out two matching lamps and gluing them onto either side of the buffer bar. Hard to do entirely neatly for me, I'm afraid. So here she is, lamped and crewed as best as I could do, and back on the tracks. Better than no crew, but this loco could definitely benefit from more work, detailing and weathering. And on to the turntable. To be returned to parking for now. Here are two more LMS brake vans that I wanted to lamp. The lamp irons on these models appear to be in the centre. I stood the vans on an old cassette case to make it easier to place the lamps. I still struggled to glue the tiny lamps in place. Doing a much better job of one than the other, unfortunately. Well, it's fortunate the one was good, but unfortunate the other wasn't. Gluing such tiny parts is definitely pushing the limits of my skills. Note there's still another brake van on the right with no lamp on it that needs to be done. Well, that's it for now. Sorry this one ran a little bit long and wordy. I hope it was of some interest. If you have any questions, suggestions or whatever, please post in the comments below.